Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the today's webinar organized by Data. Main topic for today we will be discussing is payment and transaction trends in current year 2023. Please welcome our speakers, uh, Stephen Jacob uh, from Arkwright and Marcus Fraser from Stripe. Uh, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Stephen, could you please tell us about yourself and about uh, Arkwright? Yes, Andre. Sure. Thanks for the invitation. Um, good morning to everybody. Um, I'm Stephen Jacobs. Since 15 years um, in the payments and digital banking industry as a management consultant. And um, after joining Arkwright Consulting, uh, we built a, a payment vertical, which um, today is providing well, a global consulting footprint to the um, um, payment industry with um, our offices in the Nordics, Oslo, Stockholm, also in Hamburg, London, and Dubai. But we basically cover the whole value chain from accept acceptance and acquiring to processing schemes, um, 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 issuing, and, and everything around these topics like identification and uh, consumer finance. And um, yeah, one of the biggest topics over the last years, embedded finance. So uh, a really pleasure to speak with you about these um, um, topics today. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Marcus, uh, could you please tell us about yourself and uh, tell something about Stripe? Absolutely. So first of all, good morning to everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, Andre, for hosting this session. And thanks, Stephen, for well, leading a discussion with me, hopefully. And my name is Marcos Reiser Duor. So I'm half German, half Portuguese, and I lead Stripe's business in the DACH and CE region. DACH is obviously Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, and CE is covering Central and Eastern Europe with a strong focus on the business in Poland and Czech Republic, but also covering the business in some of the Baltic states. Um, most of you might know uh, Stripe. Stripe is a technology company building global infrastructure for money movement um, and serving companies from all sizes and segments and industry. Um, when I've taken over the role at Stripe three years ago, it was my task to expanding and managing the business for Stripe here in the region. Um, and since then, we've been able to, to achieve quite significant growth. So not only have we been able to serve loads of customers from different sizes and segments across different uh, industries, but also we've built a, have we built the team in the region, and this includes as well building a partner ecosystem in the region. And that's why I'm happy to be here today and discussing with some of our partners, which is Arkwright and Data Art. So very much looking forward to having a discussion with you guys, and um, thank you for having me again. Thank you so much. Okay, and a couple of words about me. So I'm working uh, in Data Art for the last 70 years. My current position is program manager and subject matter expert in payments and fintechs. Uh, well, what about Data Art? Uh, Data Art is a global software engineering firm uh, which takes a uniquely human approach to solving problems. With 20, uh, 25 years of experience, teams of highly trained engineers all around the world, uh, deep industry sector knowledge and ongoing technology research, we help clients to create custom software that improves their operations and opens new markets. And well, maybe the main point, powered by people first principle, which I observed in countless projects, Seriously, we work with clients at any scale on any platform and adapt alongside with them as they evolve. So that's about me, Data. Um, sh probably, shall we start from the trans and payment presentation, Stephen? I know you prepared something for us. Yes, a pleasure. I will share my screen. And as you know, the objective of this webin webinar is to speak about um, uh, trends in payments and transaction. We prepared, prepared a little bit um, on what we can expect from the next year or from the new year. And also a little overview of what has been shaping in the last year, in 2022. So um, I, will, I will guide you um, um, through these slides for 10 minutes on um, um, what, what developments we see in the market. So we start with a little review. What were the highlights in 2022? And uh, I would start, first of all, with a very, very top-down view on the European payment market. And um, for this, we have just outlined the different 
European countries here on this landscape um, in their size or their relevance and their maturity in payments. And um, you have on the um, uh, uh, y-axis the transaction value, which is a good indicator for the number of uh, the, the volume per capita, which is spent via cards per person per country. And on the um, um, x-axis, you have the number of transactions an average inhabitant in these countries performs with a car per year. So this really gives a good overview on how mature are the different markets in terms of cashless payments. I mean, this is just focusing on, on card-based payments. Um, I'm, I'm not reflecting A to A, for example, but still a good indication on the um, um, overall market maturity. And what we see here on the first uh, glimpse, I think, is that this is a very heterogeneous outlet, uh, out, um, 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 line. So um, from Bulgaria with around 50 transactions per card to Norway with um, um, 600, we th see there's a um, 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 difference in the factor of 12. So um, um, very heterogeneous market. And the second thing you can see here is that, that you can even build some clusters. And there's a cluster of developing markets where countries like uh, not just Bulgaria, Romania, or um, um, Hungary are in, but also Germany and Italy. Um, I think for us as Germans, as very cash-minded um, people, not very surprising. Then you have maturing markets in the middle and um, 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 at the um, very evolved area with the markets we see as approaching cashlessness or cashless societies with the Nordics and uh, UK here. This, of course, is a static view. More it, interesting it is, I think, to see how have these markets evolved over the last years. And um, for this, we've, we've taken, two ex taken two examples, um, Germany on the um, 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 bottom left part and Norway on the top right part to give you a feeling on how these markets have evolved over time. Um, you still see the other European markets shaded in a light gray in the background. This are the 2021 markets just as a comparison. But if you first take a look at Germany, um, I think what's very interesting is that we see, of course, a very substantial growth. But we all have perceived the COVID times, I think, as a big, big boost in uh, uh, digital payments. But if you zoom it out on a European scale, these are just tiny, tiny steps. So um, what felt like huge leap for us was in, in reality just something um, um, very small, which means we can really expect probably two more decades of substantial growth um, um, of our payment industry in Germany or in the whole DACH area, if you will. Um, the question then, then which, which, which um, follows out of this um, 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 insight, I think, is um, how are these very advanced, evolving, um, um, evolved markets um, um, doing? And um, how have they developed over the last um, years? And for this, we have taken Norway as an example. Um, and here you see that over the last years, since 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, you also see a very robust growth trend. And it's been even growing faster than Germany. So um, even the most advanced markets are not facing a saturation yet when it comes to cashless um, 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 developments um, or development of card payments. And well, of course, here's a little bump. This is uh, COVID-induced. So um, um, this is, is not to be um, um, reflected too much. So overall, key message, payment industry, highly attractive growth business, probably for the next one or two de decades. Coming from this quantitative overview, I want to share you a few highlights from uh, the last year, which we have seen as especially shaping in the industry. And um, there are five points. The first one, we see a continued shift to digital payments. This is what I've just spoken about, so um, um, I'm nothing surprising. Then we've seen a significantly worsening macroeconomic environment, um, inflation, increasing interest rates, global energy prices, availability of funds have been re reduced, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, private consumption. So the whole industry is facing uncertainties, and this is, of course, reducing innovation climate, uh, uh, um, investment climate. 
Um, and as a consequence, we can even see a certain capital market reset, which has wiped out 200 to, uh, 200 to 300% of the valuation growth um, 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 from 2020 to 2021 and has been returned to levels of uh, 2019. So this is a study from Finch. I find these, these numbers really remarkable. Um, and chance show, really shows that currently the prices for, for um, fintechs have really gone down. This is also speaking very much with the third point, cooling in the fintech. So we see a end of the fintech boom in terms of new um, 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 foundings um, in payments, lending and crypto. Um, and another insight from the Finch um, um, study, um, the level of uh, new fintechs, which have been founded, uh, plateaued since 2018 and then dropped. And now they went down end of 2021 by 85%. So we really see a massive cooling in the whole fintech in industry. Um, on the other hand, one of the biggest drivers is the continued rise of banking as a service. And one of the sayings I'm, I'm, I really love is, Banking as a service is the great democratization of financial services. So you don't need to bank, be a bank anymore to sell financial services products. And this now, I think, opens the scene to embedded finance, because at the end, embedded finance is nothing but the other side of the coin of, of banking as a service. You have banking as a service um, providers who offer their financial services into customer journeys of non-banks. And this is what you call embedded finance then at the end. And um, here we see an increasing maturity um, of banking and service providers in terms of services. So they're more specific banking as a services like cards, as a service credits, as a service insurances, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And newer and bigger partnerships. I think for me in Germany, the biggest um, partnership was what we have seen with um, ADSC and Solaris with um, um, a uh, fintech taking over a credit card portfolio of um, three quarter of a million cards. So this is also a very strong sign of increasing maturity. And the fifth biggest trend, I think, is the commoditization of um, buy now, pay later. Um, we went into 2022 with still some kind of a bubble around this topic. And um, this faced a lot of headwinds and a plethora of issues, financial, regulatory scoring, funding, et cetera, et cetera. And this really deflated this valuation bubble around buy now, pay later. But we would still always say this bubble has not burst, um, but is um, globally still very, very relevant buy now, pay later. It is a proven value for customers. It's a proven value for merchants. So buy now, pay later is here to stay, but as a commodity. Yeah, so much for 2022. What can we expect for 2023? And um, <clears throat> I think if if we would now have to speak about all the trends which are face which we are facing in the European payment landscape, we see retail payments, we see corporate payments, we see a sphere of consumer finance, merchant finance. This is always overlapping, and in these spheres, there are just tons of topics one could now elaborate on. Um, but um, considering time and uh, complexity of these topics, again, we have selected um, five key trends in 2023, um, which we believe are the ones which will be very, very important to watch in the next year. And um, the first one is speaking again with um, embedded finance that's going to become more and more relevant. This is not a question. It's going to pick up for the speed. And we will have more sophisticated banking as a service players or payments as a service players. Then second point, selective evolution of incumbents. We see increasingly incumbents also trying to enter this game. Um, and of course, they um, the required the ability, ability to integrate into the um, customer journeys of the partners, which um, 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 are requirements in technology platforms, handling large amount of data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, from our perspective, the key requirements here is the definition execution of a deliberate strategy. Um, it's a massive transformation which is required to build up this third sales channel. 
um, and this requires a whole transformation of the company. And this is something which I think only selective incumbents will be able to evolve to. Then the third point, and this speaks to the capital market reset and the cooling of the market is an ongoing industry consolidation. This is something we can already see um, that uh, strate strategic investors are increasingly um, um, looking for uh, good deals. And we also see in, in, in uh, um, investment in uh, venture capital that there's a shift from growth at all costs more to monetization and consciousness and costs. Um, then a fourth point, European payment initiatives need to be watched. On the one hand, the topic AP, I'm not really convinced this is solving a big customer problem. So even if this would be successful, I'm not sure if this, if it's really a um, um, big um, um, impact for the market. But the digital euro in general, here I have another view, this uh, is something we perceive as quite likely and um, as being forced into the market. And in Q3 2023, we will see whether this completely new kind of money will be brought into the market. Maybe it's also a mixture of AP and the digital euro. And the fifth topic, this is like an um, 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 ongoing trend, platform-based digital ecosystems. What is the platform-based um, um, digital ecosystem? First of all, the role is the orchestration of customer um, of, of different services in a customer journey from different companies and this is linked through non-generic complementarities so either loyalty points or you get certain benefits from 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 taking part in these uh, customer journeys so this is something we see from the super apps this is something we see from stripe for example very much with an um, 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 ecosystem focused on, on on merchants and retailers and digital service providers um, and overall, this, this uh, approach is highly relevant in the payments industry. We see this in uh, many positions. Because here, you, of course, if, if you own this, this customer journey, you have a holistic view on the income and the customer data, which is highly relevant, for example, for, well, approaching underserved SME um, 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 retailers. I'm looking forward to Marco's view on this because I'm sure this is one of the segments um, um, Stripe is really focusing on. And to make this maybe a little bit more tangible, I've prepared one last slide. This actually is from 2021 and an outside in analysis of Stripe, where we have taken a look on how Stripe has evolved um, from a, well, payment facilitator, which is easy to integrate into a mobile checkout to a whole merchant ecosystem over the last years offering terminals, um, billing payments, uh, merchant financing, corporate cards, issuing different kinds of um, treasury and all different kinds of services circling around these merchant customer journeys. Um, and um, they've also integrated with, with Shopify, another digital ecosystem. So from a conceptual point of view, um, you have ecosystems which are, which are overlapping here. Um, but this, I think, is giving a very, very good feeling how a very successful and dynamically growing player like Stripe has evolved over the last decade from a single linear business model to a whole ecosystem. And um, well, Marcus, I'm sure this is uh, not going to be the end of your strategy, right? So um, with this overview, I would um, 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 finish my, my presentation on the trends and very positive that the next year or this year is going to be very, very interesting. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Marcos, maybe you would like to adapt something, maybe even about democratization of banking services, while I'm checking the questions from the chat. I mean, um, let me just uh, so first of all, Stephen, many thanks for sharing your insights and uh, thanks for um, basically bringing up this uh, wonderful example of our partnership with uh, Shopify. Let me just clarify that Shopify is a user of ours, a valued partner. And I believe what, what you've mentioned is absolutely true. So you can basically see that there is a journey that we were on together, or we are still on together with Shopify, which means basically to improve the customer experience of Shopify users. At the end of the day, we are a B2B company, right? We are serving Shopify with different values and different solutions that help them increase the 
experience of Shopify users on the Shopify platform. We are the technology provider in the background. We are not interested in making ourselves visible. So we are helping Shopify. We started with payments. Um, and as you said before, embedded finance, embedded payments. So basically our story and our foundation started with the idea of how to help basically to meet challenges that people have to get online payments from all over the world to their bank account. And that is, was the start of, of Stripe at the end of the day. And that was the start of working with uh, our friends from Shopify, which means that at the beginning, they started offering an own payment solution to their market. And just imagine when they started with that, uh, how complex it would have been to basically build something like that on their own. Uh, I, I believe they would have needed like a department to build that and to run that and to maintain that. And so that's why they've decided to focus on a technology solution based on an API. And that's how Shopify payments came to, to life. And from there, and that is exactly the journey that Stephen just mentioned. So thanks again for mentioning that. They basically evolved and they started adding additional value to the customer journey that their users are experiencing on their platform, which means like landing, um, using a landing opportunity that comes over the platform. And you just mentioned, Andre, how about serving um, the SME or underserved areas as uh, Stephen mentioned. And that's exactly why we work very closely with platforms that are using our services to service their customers, which usually could be like startups or SME. But let me also, um, emphasize that this is only one example, but we're seeing as well that there are loads of big enterprises that are using technology like Stripe Connect, which is our marketplace of platform technology, to build economic ecosystems, global economic ecosystems, and then add additional values to basically, or solutions to increase the value for the customer journeys, like lending to their customers, for instance, just imagine that you are a food delivery service and you are running payments, pay-ins, pay-outs, and suddenly you have a view on the um, cash flow of your customer and proactively you could address them and make them an offer of a loan that maybe, let's say, for instance, a restaurant would never get. So this might be one example, Stephen, uh, for an underserved area of our economy where technology via a platform partner, a marketplace partner could help increase value for the overall economy, just as an example. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, just, uh, I'd like to address our audience. Please don't hesitate to uh, put your questions in the chat. We'll try to uh, answer, well, as much as we can at the uh, end of this um, webinar. Uh, however, let us crack in with our um, set of questions around one of the probably the most prominent topic which is embedded finance um, uh, at least uh, it's in trends from previous years and for current year uh, why it's prominent well according to the recent article in forbes embedded finance will eventually put an end to an existing banking system what's your point of view of this statement Marcus, maybe you could start. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think this is a, a little provocative statement. Um, uh, in, in my opinion, banks uh, will still be around uh, in the far future. And, and I believe they will continue to play a significant role in the economy. Um, and, you know, um, Stripe as a technology provider, we've been partnering with banks for years and years and years. Um, and without them, working together with us in a partnership relationship, we wouldn't be able to be offering some of our solutions like lending and so on, because there are areas of this world where you need a bank to be partner of that ecosystem. And that is part of our partnership um, strategy. However, if you're referring to banking services, I believe that there will be additional market participants offering banking solutions to their customer base. Um, but, uh, and I think that's why you asked us, being a technology provider, whenever it comes to technology being an enabler in that area, it's more than naturally uh, that this is like, let's say, our area where we play. And that is why we are enabling and facilitating the technology by using, by developing technology to our customers to use that 
um, towards their customers. So products like issuing capital or treasury would not be possible without banks. We love to partner with banks and we will continue to do that. So I believe they will be around for quite some time. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Um, Steven, what's your point of view? Well, maybe yeah. uh, from a uh, German on DAX uh, region specifically. Yeah. You mention it. <clears throat> or, or generally, I was surprised reading this because normally Forbes is, is uh, yeah, putting up higher quality, I would say. This is a very, very catchy um, 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 headline. And um, I'm not at all behind this headline. And also, I mean, there's this um, 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 famous saying that banks will not be required, but banking services will be required. I also think this, this saying is wrong because as long as you have regulation, you will need regulated bodies which care and take care of this regulation and these are banks the same is true as long as you need global or international scalable robust processes you will need banking providers or banks so um, um, um i i fully disagree strongly disagree to this um, 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 headline um, but i think what has to be considered is that embedded finance is the third sales channel for banks. And this is something completely new because historically banks have two sales channels, brick and mortar branches or their own digital sales via phone or internet, doesn't matter, but they control this. And the third sales channel now is to enable non-banks to sell their own products. And for this, they completely need to build a new technology, a technological technological infrastructure, which are all of these RPs and platforms and uh, real-time services where the partners have the chance to integrate. And this is this is the new thing about embedded finance. And that's super important, but not the end of banks. Yeah, and makes sense. Let me just add something, Andre, just because I think that's very valuable what you just said, Stephen. And I believe the the situation that we have currently with more and more embedded finance or embedded payment solutions being available in the market, this is also changing the, let's say, um, the ecosystem, the banking ecosystem overall. So uh, just as an example, we are working quite closely with lots of banks, not only in the partnership area in the back end, but also we are providing solutions to banks who... And there are loads of banks that have identified that it's not their core competency to develop specific software solutions to address their customers. So they are also partnering with technology companies like ourselves to integrate parts of our solution set to their solution set facing their customers. So we have ongoing partnerships with companies like, for instance, Solaris Bank that you've mentioned before, <coughs> N26, uh, to different degrees. But that means that they are currently being very open to basically integrate solution sets from technology providers and technology partners, which is a change, I believe, right? Compared to the, let's say, the 2000 years when basically banks were developing everything on their own, I have the impression that that has changed. I don't know what your view is. Um, fully agree, but this, this is what I meant when I said banks require a deliberate, deliberate strategy to make this decision, um, because, understanding and deciding to join this kind of economics and to integrate into platforms like Stripe to use you as a reseller of their services um, to enable your customers to then offer um, 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 financial services products, which is a bank to B2B to B2C to um, 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 value chain. This, of course, is, is non, a non-trivial uh, topic to, to, to decide and to develop and um, um, requires a cultural stray, uh, change and, well, very often updated uh, uh, infrastructure. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, uh, speaking of uh, like, uh, what is uh, embedded finance for customers, for consumers, like for me, which problems uh, does embedded finance solve for end users and uh, consumers? Can you answer, Stephen? Maybe, maybe let's start from you. Sure. I mean, <clears throat> um, you always have to ask these questions coming from the customer journey. So, depending on the customer journey the customer is in, you have to see other certain points where there is 
a specific demand at this very moment inside the customer journey where he needs, I don't know, security, for example, or additional liquidity, or if it's a merchant or a B2B um, case, certain information. And then you either ask for, okay, do I get liquidity from a bank which provides certain lending or buy now pay later solution, whatever. Do I get this additional security from an insurance company, for example? Do I get the information from my platform, which has all the holistic view of the data, which, which, which supports me in taking decisions? So um, it helps the customer to get what he wants directly at the place where he is. So the worst case is to, to leave the internet, leave your computer and have to go to a brick and mortar bank to get the additional money to, 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 to um, um, buy your um, bike, for example. I mean, that's, that's the, the thing we don't want to do. At the end, we want to support the owner of the customer journey to increase his conversion and to make more business. And um, for this, he needs um, um, very often additional supportive features. And this is in very many cases embedded funds. Um, Marcus, uh, what's your point of view? What is uh, the embedded payments in your case for end users and consumers? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, we are basically touching both areas. So embedded finance and embedded payments. And obviously, um, embedded payments was the starting point of our journey, right? And you asked about what, what problems do we solve? <clears throat> what our starting point in this journey was at the end of the day was to help our users to basically get online or to receive online payments from all over the world in a reliable and easy way uh, by using technology, right? That was our narrative about integrating a seven lines of code API, which was the uh, beginning of the story of Stripe in that area. And obviously we emerged from there. And so we developed, and, and I think you, you mentioned the problem, that was a problem to be solved. But I think at the moment, what is the big change is that Embedded finance or embedded payments, as we see today, and as Steve mentioned on his overview, and thanks again for sharing that example, um, is that we have the opportunity to help customers, to help users to increase their value chain with their customers. So we are in the B2B space, right? So we're not only supporting platforms like, for instance, Shopify, but we're also working with large enterprises that are, for instance, expanding their business model from a direct business model to a marketplace or call it a platform, or maybe you call it uh, a digital ecosystem, which they had in the past, they've built that, but now they're turning it into something digital. And they basically wanna make sure that the money flows are consistent, that they are basically following uh, regulatory, uh, regulatory guidelines and that they are safe and secure. So I believe that there are tons of examples where you can develop new business models, leverage additional revenue streams, but as well like increase customer loyalty or even, um, well, going global, for instance, right? If you want, if you're basically acting like in a defined area and suddenly you have the will to go global, look for the partners, look for the solutions and build out a new business model. Uh, and that's something we're seeing quite a lot from startups to platforms to large enterprises I think there are a couple of very prominent uh, examples here in the German area. For instance, there are some companies in the so-called German Mittelstand, um, let's say a segment that is very innovative in their focus area, but have they been really outstanding when it comes to digitalization? I think they're not perceived like that. But what we're seeing at the moment, that there are quite some companies of that segment that are going global, that they are using technology, that they are using embedded finance to increase stickiness with the customers. So I believe um, there are tons of problems that can be solved, but even more opportunities that we can leverage. Okay, perfect. Well, I see a couple of questions uh, from the chat. Uh, uh, give us uh, 15 minutes at the end of uh, this round, we'll uh, try to answer them. Uh, we have two, three more questions uh, from our list. So let us finalize regarding the embedded uh, finance and embedded uh, payments, but let's have a look from a different angle, from companies' perspective, existing fintech companies. Well, uh, why should companies consider embedding uh, finance products 
into their existing models in the first place? Like, why? Um, I think there are three reasons. The first one is to support your core business. So best example, you sell high quality bikes. Not everybody can afford um, 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 to purchase these. So you include um, um, a buy now pay later or a financing solution. Um, supports your core business because people don't jump out um, um, due to the, the high prices. The second one, what Marcus just said, um, you can really strate strategically think about financial services as a way to develop new business models to drive new additional revenue or, or um, 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 uh, profit. Of course, it can't completely overstretch your, your customer journey. It has to fit into this, right? Um, and the third point is, this relates a lot to the platform-based digital ecosystems, that you generate more non-generic complementarities or you increase the stickiness of your um, um, ecosystem by um, 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 offering additional services which have synergies between each other. And a um, very tangible example for this is, for example, if you consider this uh, South African uh, insurance company, Vitality, one of the best practices for uh, digital ecosystems, um, you get your rate, you have to pay your monthly rate calculated on your health score. Um, but on top, when you have a good score, you get free um, places or reserved um, um, VIP places at different gyms to do your workout. Um, and this is this kind of, of non-generic uh, complementarities between these different services. And, um, 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 and uh, this, as I've said, increases the stickiness and um, embedded finance uh, products wherever you depending on your customer journey, orchestrate them into the flow, can add on these three points. Core business, additional profit in business, or stickiness. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Marcus, from your point of view, from maybe from uh, Stripe's point of view, uh, why companies need to consider uh, embedded finance and embedded payments? Yeah, I believe um, I believe Stephen has mentioned the most important point. I believe that you know the economy is is changing. Our consumers are getting more and more uh, requiring additional services. And at the end of the day, um, I believe, as, as Stephen mentioned, and just to add it, I think what is really important is is that like a natural fit, right? Uh, so I, I don't believe that embedded finance is uh, something that everyone should be doing, right? It needs to be a fit. Uh, into the customer journey that I'm that the company is um, basically providing at the moment. So I think there are natural fits. Like for instance, let's say if you have an existing business model, which is for instance food delivery service, um, offering um, lending services to the restaurants, that might be a natural expansion of your existing value chain. Or on the other hand, if you basically issue credit cards for drivers for a let's say restricted use case that makes sense and is something that is natural. And I believe that's the moment when both um, company types in this example, the driving company and the restaurant, they will accept it and basically embrace it as an option for them to finance their uh, business growth. But there might be others where it doesn't make sense, right? So I believe that is something that um, entrepreneurs should be reflecting before taking that uh, decision. And I believe that the second one is, um, and I think the example we touched on before, which is like marketplaces, is a very important one, right? If you are running a marketplace or a platform business or are planning to do that, that is something that is possible with embedded finance solutions. And from this point on, the journey will be a different one because if you go into that field, that will give you the option to offer embedded finance to your end users via that platform. So I think... You need to think about it. I think the possible use cases are endless, if you wish, so I'm very optimistic, but I also believe that there are some things that you need to consider. And the most important one is, does it make sense? Is it a natural fit? Does that, is my value proposition really a value proposition that if being enriched by financial um, services solutions, that is a trusted solution for the uh, customer? 
especially in the B2B space. I think that's something you need to consider. Yeah, I, I'd like to stress this point. Um, I think that's the most important thing. Um, you don't do embedded finance law pour law, but you need to understand your customer groups and their specific needs and expectations to their customer journey in this moment. So it's really a lot about um, um, customer analytics, which, which is required um, um, as a uh, first step or mm -hmm. as Marcos entrepreneurial spirit, because I think uh, entrepreneurs should always know, okay, where's the market going? What do customers want? With this kind of a sense. Yeah. And in some cases it makes absolutely sense because we had that maybe in the brick and mortar business already. Just imagine you go to a large, let's say electronics shop and you buy like your fancy TV uh, equipment usually you get a financing offering exactly at the point of sale, right? But the point of sale is now a different one. If you decide to purchase it online, you want to get that solution maybe offered online to you, right? And you don't want to go to your bank and ask for a loan to basically cover that. So I believe that's what I meant with the, so we have examples uh, in the brick and mortar world, and now we are basically transferring that into the online world. Um, and so this is what I meant with natural. And I think, Stephen, we are on one page when it comes to that. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, regarding the embedded finance, is it simple? Is it not? Well, maybe from technological perspective. So based upon your experience, practical one, what are some of the challenges business face when they introduce in embedded finance into their business model? Marcus, probably uh, that, that question. Would be yeah, I, I will try to make a start, but then I will hand over to the consultant because I will I strongly believe, as I said, there are loads of business where it makes sense. But um, I also believe that technology plays a fundamental part. And that is not, and that's exactly the reason why techno technological companies like us are in that space. But you never should forget about your customer journey and what you want basically to achieve. So you need to consider technology as an enabler, but you need to be very aware of the business model and how to plan that. So it doesn't make sense to develop a business model and forget about technology. Uh, and on the other hand, it doesn't make sense to start thinking about uh, technology, but don't have a clear view on your business model. And that's the moment. So I really recommend people to, if you wanna go on that journey, and if you wanna build like a global strategy including like embedded finance and embedded payment you need to be very clear about the picture that you want to basically achieve at the end of the journey but you need to consider both components from the beginning and and that's <laughs> let me head over to steve that's the moment when you need to think about requirements from a um from a regulatory perspective and global level so you need technology partners that are reflecting that and you need a good consulting partner to basically go with you on that journey and help basically moderate between technology and regulatory requirements. And that is something like upright, I believe, Steve. Yeah, blood, sweat and tears. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's really, um, I think when it comes to, to uh, um, updating of, of techno uh, technology systems, that's uh, one of the biggest um, challenges incumbents face. Um, because embedded finance very often only works if you have real-time interaction and real-time decision-making. For example, if we speak about instant issuing, um, if you use a credit card, for example, to fund a certain acquisition or purchase, you want it to be issued instantly. And I don't mean near instant, which is like 30 seconds, but really instant, instant which is from a customer perspective, perspective, maybe two or three seconds. Now, if you use a bank partner who has a very, very robust and scalable issuing um, um, processes with millions of cards on their platform, but still batch um, are driven, then you won't get this instant decision-making process. Um, and this is, I think, what many large incumbents are seeing, this dilemma between we have existing completely scalable written off infrastructure but it's not really fitting the requirements we are seeing in this third sales channel anymore. Um, and then they have to decide what they do. Do they migrate to a new uh, infrastructure? This, of course, is always a big, big risk. Um, and a 
tremendous investment which, which is required in terms of capital and resources? Um, or do they do some kind of a dual system approach where they integrate a second system in a separate environment and then it's not scalable? Um, and maybe they still need to integrate everything into the um, um, financial reporting and in the scoring boards, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is uh, also not trivial for then at the end, maybe very, very small business. And um, this is a big dilemma for, for um, 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 uh, large banks. Um, but uh, we see that this is becoming very visible and um, many banks have at least piloted or are going into this um, 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 direction or are going into partnerships where they do uh, build joint ventures with, uh, with, with tech partners um, to update their, their infrastructure. Um, but all in all, these are not projects of uh, one or two quarters. This usually takes a few years. Um, and uh, this is required what I meant at the beginning when I said you need a deliberate strategy which is executed properly. And out of this strategy normally comes the decision on how do I build real-time capable systems which are able to play with the other ones in the in the room in the environment uh, in the embedded finance um, um, game um, and and this is, 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 is uh, yeah a hard decision to take on timing on investment on partner yeah perfect Okay, uh, maybe last question regarding the embedded finance and embedded payments. However, this is the favorite one, uh, my favorite one. Well, tell me the future one. What might be the next evolution step for fintechs and for embedded finance? Not this year, maybe in two, three, five years. <clears throat> Marcus, what do you think? Well, um, I don't know exactly what it will be, but uh, I know that there will be change coming our way. That, that is something that is obvious. But the only thing that I know that we as a technology company basically supporting with infrastructure for money movement, that we are very, very closely listening to what our users tell us and what they believe are the trends. And uh, basically we take a very close look at the expectations that are raised by our users and reflect them and build the solutions that they need moving forward. So you've seen it uh, on the example of, of Shopify. The starting point was basically integrating payments. Today, they are offering uh, loans, they are issuing credit cards and so on. And that's what big enterprises do based on our technology. Uh, one topic that came up a couple of uh, years ago, that was in 2020, was how to manage tax in an e-commerce context. And what we did, we built Stripe Tax so that customers are able to manage their tax in their e-commerce play. So there will be new requirements coming our way. We will listen to our users. We will listen to our consulting partners like Arkwright and get an understanding what is required in the market. Then we will evaluate it and integrate it into our platform to increase our offering for our existing customer base. So we will not do it on our own, but we will listen, understand, and basically translate it into value-based solutions for our customers. And Steven, what do you think? What are the, yeah. uh, What is about future? I would, I would agree. Um, but I think one can differentiate between the extrapolation of existing trends, something we already see. And this, I think one of the biggest topics we see is of course embedded finance and we will see more sophistication of the customer journeys. We will see more mature banking as a service providers who, who feed into these customer journeys. So this has become going to become more relevant. And I think we are maybe two, three, four percent yet seeing what will be there in 10 years. Um, and then there's a big bubble of trends we don't know yet. And uh, this is hard to forecast, but but uh, everybody who has played a little bit with uh, chat GPT over the last month might get a feeling what can happen. And um, 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 this, this for me was personally mind blowing and I'm a big, <laughs> big fan with this. And something like this can happen anytime. And I mean, AI um, is, is important in the payments industry when, especially when you look at, at, at fraud and these things, and, and maybe also, uh, and Ray, for you for coding now, um, but we don't know what this will be um, impacting in the next next month uh, or, or years. Um, but I'm sure that there will be severe impacts. 
and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing them and uh, exchanging thoughts on this. Lovely. Okay. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, uh, we have a really interesting question from uh, Dennis Stark from Wave 4. So let me read it. How do the mentioned global trends apply to various regions, in particular LATAM? I see that LATAM is far behind on many topics, open banking, BNPL, CryptoCard, and even Google and Apple Pay support for banks. Yeah. What do you think? That's kind of big, uh, Stephen, probably uh you could start yeah i can i can give a generic answer um not really prefer um, I'm, I'm prepared for latam at the moment um um colleague who's covering this this region but what i can say is um in europe we have a very very mature and old banking industry what i know from the projects we did in latam is that there it's a well it's sometimes under more underbanked area and it's easier to implement new solutions and what i've seen from brazil um that the 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 the, the fintechs there are actually very very um innovative and successful and the um uh, uh inhabitants or the the users are more open to using these these inno inno innovations so this is this is my my two cent here so um, actually, I've perceived the Latin region as um, um, more pro progressive than uh, uh, Europe in these areas. And I think all of these trends we've spoken about, except for the European payment ambitions, of course, are true for, for Latin. Yeah, Marcus, what's your thoughts about uh, developing regions? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a clear perspective on Latin because that is not in my responsibility area. Um, the only thing I know is that it is on our roadmap and that we are basically serving this market with defined solutions. I'm not completely sure, I must confess, what our roadmap is for the specific areas that uh, were mentioned in that question. But what we're seeing is that we are starting to serve more and more emerging markets, if you want to call them like that, like UAE, but also in the CE region, basically adding our offerings uh, to, the, uh, to our solution set in Poland, in Czech Republic and other areas. But uh, I would really recommend to, to reach out to folks that are basically covering this region because they have a profound view on the roadmap available. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. We have another question from Lado uh, Gadalidze, which uh, this question actually resonates with me as an end user and customer. What about tokenization and customer identification procedures? that accompany embedded payments. What are the trends regarding this? If you pass us any information you can provide. Yeah, I think uh, a very good question. Super hot topic. Um, how did uh, one service provider in this area um, um, formulated the battle to onboard? Um, at the end, uh, uh, it's all about how do you onboard a customer in the journey? Because when you want to shop a bike, you might not be aware that you need to identify for a consumer finance um, product. Um, and uh, here it's really about the magic of embedded finance. How do you calibrate the process to take out as much friction as possible to onboard this client and do all of these KYC, AML um, 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 scoring uh, um, process, procedures to hand out the credit. Um, and for these things, of course, it's super important to work with some identification providers or tokenization. And here it's about creativity. How can you use in your certain regulated area um, so re reflecting the, the, the local regulation and the different service providers who have all these uh, data you need, how do you orchestrate them to reduce the, any kind of friction in the onboarding flow to sell these embedded finance products? Because at the end, all embedded finance products are usually regulated. So you need to fulfill certain compliance um, steps and um, maneuvering around them is not, uh, not trivial. Um, and I think the key success factor um, in, 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 uh, uh, to optimize the conversion. OK, 
Okay, uh, Marcus, I know uh, onboarding and KYC is a big part of Stride platform and ecosystem. However, mm -hmm. do you know what kind of trends might be? Specifically for me, can I, like as a user, uh, be onboarded once in one big system and then use it as a token everywhere I go? Like, yeah. that, that would be a dream for me. Yeah, and that is exactly one of the areas uh, that we are basically investing in. And there are solutions being available right now. You've probably seen like Stripe Identity on one hand. And on the other hand, if you could, when you're uh, mentioning KYC uh, and onboarding, which is especially in the marketplace and in the platform economy, it's a pretty important topic. And that's where we basically provide out of the box solutions to make that as easy as possible for our users that are running these platforms and, and marketplaces. So we are providing the services from a technology perspective. Um, but at the end of the day, we can do that in a regulated way. But uh, the responsibility at the end of the day remains with the owner of that platform. I think, Stephen, you would agree on that one, right? You can yeah, have that responsibility. Yeah. And, and you have to, to, to really look market by market, what are the requirements? and. What are the, I don't know, yeah. identity service providers? Do you have federated IDs already, like in the Nordics? Um, or do you still need to do some kind of a web web ID like we do it in, in, in Germany very often? So, um, um, and, uh, <laughs> so this is, this is uh, there we are far away from a homogeneous European market. It okay. might be a topic for the next uh, uh, discussion we can have, Andre, to, to dig more into deep. Yeah, that would be an interesting topic. Right, I'm cautious about time. Uh, do we probably, yeah, let's do one last question from, really sorry, I, I uh, really bet with name, uh, Hetzelkai Avanikoko. What is our perspective for contactless payment technology and how can risk be mitigated for both companies and customers, especially for FinTech ecosystem? Uh, Steven, maybe? Yeah. <clears throat> It's, it's, I'm trying to find a way how to answer because it's, it's, it's commodity contact is payment and it's something customers request. And I mean, you can think about, you can discuss what kind of contact is technology. Is it really NFC um, based? Or, I mean, we see a lot of domestic mobile payment systems in, in, in Europe. Vips, Bank ID, Blick, Twint, BISM, which are skyrocketing in relevance in their local markets. And they're usually not using NFC, but they're using uh, QR codes or one-time codes. So um, um, contactless is super, super. Um, and uh, customers have accepted to use it. They have, um, 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 are increasingly accepting it. And um, it's, it's not, not a question for me whether this, this will be relevant or not. And there will also be use cases where you are able to combine online and offline uh, shopping with, with contactless payments. Um, so, uh, 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 yeah. Marcus, what do you think? No, agreed. And, and, and I believe, especially the last point you just mentioned, Stephen, is particularly inter interesting, right? How, what, what will be the future when there will be business models that are basically coming from a platform perspective, touching on both payment methods, right? Being yeah. like paying online and on the other hand, paying offline, but paying uh, contactless. What are the use cases? There are some that we are currently already supporting with our technologies, but uh, I think there is more to come. I mean, we also have like uh, Apple's initiatives in that context, right? Um, so there is a, this is a huge topic for the future. Completely agree. Okay, uh, right, uh, we are uh, uh, exceeded our time. So, well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all attendees for attending the seminar. Steven, Marcus, thank you for your uh, answers, for your presentation. Right. Thank you. Okay, let's conclude. Thank you all, have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.